Praise the Lord. Let me say how great it is to be back together with all of you. I hope the isolation isn't treating you too badly. I know we always like to be together, and I know we love each other. And I understand that this separation for a time is a part of that love, that we care deeply enough for each other to be away and help each other in this way. But I can't say it helps with the missing, so let me add, we do definitely miss you in church, and I hope this message finds you well. I hope you're blessed in the Lord, and I hope you're prepared for what the Lord's going to speak to you. As a matter of fact, I hope you're taking this whole time to listen to what the Lord is saying. Because the only one who can speak correctly, completely correctly, in the midst of this trial is our God. The only one who fixes all of our problems, surface and underneath, is our God and our Christ. And this is a perfect time to turn to him with all of our needs, with all of our requests, and let him massage our situation and prove our faith time and time again. With that said, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer to begin our time. Dear Lord my God, I thank you that you are big enough for every moment, that your grace covers us even now, and Lord, I pray that your grace would abound to us in this time as we search your scriptures, as we look into the truths of your salvation, God, today. Lord, this holy week, I pray that you would bless us. Bless us together, bless us apart, and help us to serve, even in our individual stories at this time. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles, you can turn to Luke, the 23rd chapter. Not too big a passage today, just a few verses, 39 through, through 43. As I do that, let me encourage you to be joining us uh, for Easter. Obviously, this Sunday is Easter, and uh, Easter is going to be a little different this year. But it doesn't change for us what we celebrate for Easter. Even though we won't be amassing together, as we often do, let me tell you what, as a minister, I love that time. But in spite of all that, the love I have for a day together pales in comparison to the love I have for Christ and that which we celebrate, which is Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Now, obviously, we're thinking about that, and hopefully you're thinking about that a lot this week. So much happens in Holy Week, as we refer to it, in that last week when Christ lived among us before his resurrection. So much, I'm not going to say changes, but I will say a lot of elements around Christ are profoundly affected. The disciples affected, the Pharisees affected, the government affected. And at the same time, it, it, it almost goes unnoticed in a lot of ways. I mean, the Romans simply kill someone and they wash their hands of it as Pilate did and said they're done. But that is but the tip of the iceberg in Christ's story. Where most people's stories end, Christ brings new beginning. With that in mind, let's look at Luke 23 and consider a part of Holy Week, not all of it. And today I want to look at the passage, I want us to look at the passage of the scripture with the two thieves that were crucified on each side of Christ. Please turn to Luke 23 and we'll begin reading in verse 39. You can follow along on the screen, or you can read in your own Bibles, and I, I encourage you to do that. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. That's Christ. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Before we even come to our passage, there was a whole bunch of activity that brought us to this moment. I don't want us to forget the things that led to the cross. 
That last final week, we learned so much about Christ's character and love, as, as well as what brought about the crucifixion, including Judas. But we realized through it all that Christ was never running from his destiny. He was always steadily moving toward the cross. And all those moments of teaching and training, they were to prepare us for the eventual realization that somehow or other, Jesus was always who he said he was. You know, that might seem like an afterthought for us here. But I really wonder how many of the disciples or, or those who followed Christ, believing in his power, believing in his love, never quite grasped his being. I mean, knowing a person is one of the hardest things in the world. People are complicated. Most of us are willing to admit we don't even fully understand ourselves. And then we think we got others figured out. It's a ridiculous notion. But God knows we are not good at this. That is why Christ showed us the Father time and time again and did so many loving and caring and teaching things while he was with us. It seemed like near the end, each moment was so rich. I think specifically of Christ watching, washing the disciples' feet. How God in the flesh would lower himself to serve. You know, we get this false notion that this example was Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus humbled himself. But Jesus was not the servant. We are the servant. He did that for us. Not to make himself less, but to make us realize what was really important. He was showing us how we ought to to serve one another and how we ought to love one another. He lowered himself so that we would look foolish unless we did the same thing. Fame in Christ then, if I can even say that, is not fleeting, but it is paradoxical. God measures by intangibles. We focus so much on the flesh and the bone and personal accomplishment. You've probably heard this before. Christ is the dividing line. As he divided the two thieves in our passage, the destinies they have are divided in him. As he offers life to death, he offers life from death. Actually, it's a little amazing that Christ was offering life while dying on the cross. Of course, we understand the cross is what offers us life. And he didn't come for, our, for himself. He didn't die for himself. And don't ever mistakenly think that anyone killed Jesus. People have pointed fingers and accused people of killing Jesus throughout the centuries. You killed Jesus. The Jews killed Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. No one could take this man's life. If he was half the man he said he was, then it would be easy to realize this. No one took Jesus' life. He willingly gave it up for you and me. If anyone put Jesus on the cross... It was my sin, and it was your sin for which he died. But even I didn't place him there. He willingly accepted the cross for the benefit that was placed before him, for the love that he held, for the hope for you and me. I've often seen the thieves represented in different ways. One the believing, one the unbelieving, one the saved, one the unsaved. And there is some truth in that. Though while I was exposing, uh, no, that's not the right word, expounding upon the passage today, I always like to let the passage speak for itself. I feel like there's some minutia and things that are often missed. What is the chasm that separated these thieves, the one supposedly 
believing and saved and the other supposedly not believing and not saved. Well, I want us to realize the one believed in God. Actually, and I'm not speaking of the saved one. I'm speaking of the unsaved one. If you look at his words, it seems he had at the very least a belief in God. It said one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. I actually have a little bit of a problem with this guy. Not the same problem most people have. I think a lot of people might presume he has disbelief or perhaps pride that is keeping him from God. And it is true that those things often keep us from God. It's normally disbelief, it's normally pride, and our sin keeps us from knowing God. And I think it's pretty evident in our passage that these two people being crucified are sinful people. I mean, we, have, we literally have thieves dying on a cross in our passage. And there might be some pride in his words. Maybe there's some arrogance. But that's really not what I think is going on in this passage. When I think of pride, someone whose pride comes to mind, of course, is, is the Pharisees. This is not the first man I think of. You can argue that disbelief kept this man from, and, and the others, from knowing Christ in, in some form. But, but in what way was that a part of it? I mean, we all realize that this, at its heart, is a faith issue. We all realize that disbelief in Christ, at its heart, is a faith issue. And I do notice a certain mocking tone in the thief's words. Maybe that is what it is. I mean, it is possible this man thinks this moment is proving something he had argued with others. This Jesus really wasn't much, he thought. He can't even save himself. That was what those at the foot of the cross said. So maybe he was parroting off of them. He saved others, but he could not save himself, they said. And maybe this man was sort of copying their thoughts. And this idea is common enough. And you know what, this idea actually, saving others and not saving yourselves, is, is almost categorically representative of worldly goodness. Even a higher plane of worldly goodness as we understand it. Someone who gives their life in service to others. We, we all know that's a great thing. But ultimately, even those good end right here, where our passage finds us, at death's door. And their deeds might have lasting benefits, but they cannot save themselves from death. That's the human limit. The problem with Christ, of course, in our passage, or the problem that the people recognized, and the reason they're so adamant to their accusations is because Christ pro proposed himself to be beyond our limits. But that brings me back to this thief, what he actually said. And I, I like to think he was human. What do I mean by that? If I were on the cross, I think what I would have is despair. So I wonder if this thief is despairing. Perhaps some people have the conviction enough to stare into the abyss of death with proven, brazen, sorry, unmoving principle. But that's not most people. And it's hard for me to imagine anyone in this thief's position dying on the cross in pride. You know, as they say, no one in a foxhole is an atheist. No, instead, listen closely to his words. He's not someone who doesn't believe in God. He says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. He means himself and the other thief, I believe. Maybe there were more people. Now, it does say that he hurled insults at Christ, which he obviously did do. These short few sentences we have are not the full conversation. I don't know if he responded penitently or unbelievingly after this exchange. But I do know the salvation that Christ offered him was not the way he wanted to be saved in our passage. 
Honestly, I like to think perhaps before the end he came to his senses, senses and both thieves are in heaven, but I have no reason to think they, that he did. And that brings me to the first real problem this thief had. He doesn't want the salvation that Christ is providing him. Christ does not save us in the way we want to be saved in our humanness. This man wanted down from the cross. But Christ offers us life in spite of death. And we're better off for it. Christ did not come to preserve our worldly life and our worldly inheritance. He came to bring us something better, something grander, something greater than what we could gain on our own. There are limits to what we can gain on our own. I think it's no coincidence that these men are thieves. Thieves take what is not theirs. What stops a thief then? What keeps someone from taking? Conviction in principle, perhaps? Conviction in God, perhaps? But if you were to get the mindset of a thief, thieves instead think of themselves first. They must. They think they take because they can. Perhaps they feel they deserve it or they've earned it. But thieves cannot justify themselves any more than you and I can justify themselves, though we try to justify ourselves in our minds. We all justify ourselves with weak justification, a justification that does not truly justify, it just shields us from the guilt of what it is we do. No, I have every reason to believe that this first thief did believe in God. But he didn't believe in Christ. When we say Christ is the dividing line, we mean it. Listen to this. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into our kingdom, into your kingdom. Sorry, your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. There are a number of things happening with this second thief. But it's coming down to the one thing that really makes a difference. You could argue that he has humility it, at some level, in some way. Obviously he does, but I don't think that's the difference. Well, we could think about it this way. How do you recognize a king? What makes a king so different? Well, you might answer, you see him wearing a crown, perhaps he's wearing robes, maybe it's his servants, maybe it's his carriage, maybe it's the adornments, his castle even. But what if you were to strip those things away? What if you took those things from a king and a king sat there before you? Most kings are just like us, average people. There'd be nothing that would separate them from their subjects. If they were in a crowd, how would you know them unless you knew them personally from the beginning? But even if you were to take a king and take away his crown and take away his robe and take away his adornments, does it change the fact that they are a king? You know, a king outside of his kingdom might not have the same graces. But it doesn't mean they don't still hold the title. Maybe they wouldn't have the benefits of the title. But perhaps there's something more going on here. You know, God's kingdom has always been something of an upside-down kingdom. The first will be last. The last will be first. If you want to be great, you must make yourself the least. You aren't valued then from what is on the outside, but what is on the inside. What is inside, in every way, is what matters in God's kingdom. And you can't put on a show in God's kingdom because God always sees through it. God sees through you. And I'm not saying the first thief was putting on a show, but the second thief isn't either. 
So what is revealed is rather telling. The second thief, it, it might be humility, but I actually think that's a small part of it. He doesn't consider himself worthy to be saved. He doesn't ask Jesus to save him. All he asks is that Christ remembers him. Now, maybe this difference doesn't amount to a whole lot. But I think in God's kingdom, the ones who think they deserve to be saved are not the ones that are. The ones who are broken instead realize they don't deserve Christ. Those are the ones that get him. No one ever comes to God on their own glories. No one ever finds Christ on their reputation or by their own calculation. You can find Christ only through the sheer audacity of surrender. You don't need to be something you're not. You just need to know yourself enough to know that Christ took your punishment. For the thief, I, I feel like this comes about in a very surreal way. He says, this man does not deserve this. I don't think he could help but realize in the midst of this that he did. That he deserved the punishment. He said as much that we are deserving of the punishment we're receiving. Now maybe to you and I, capital punishment for thievery seems very harsh. It does to me. But he understood that that was the law. And we don't know the full limits to what they did. But he knew he had committed the crimes. He knew he was a sinner. And he knew that he was going to die. He also realized that Christ did not commit the crimes. I think this is amazing. Because... I can think of very few instances where everyone seems to realize <laughs> that everything thrown at, <laughs> at the accused is fake, but everyone's still going along with it. Even the thief knew the accusations blamed upon Christ were anything but real. I think the Pharisees, of course, knew they brought forth the false accusations. Did the people realize that these were fake accusations? Pontius Pilate seemed to realize these were fake accusations. I don't think the people were much dumber. I think this thief and most everyone realized Christ did not deserve what, was, what he was getting. But he also realized something deeper. A king is not honored in his kingdom, away from his kingdom. So he asked him, remember me when you come upon your kingdom. You know, it's not fully fleshed out, his belief. But I believe it becomes pretty obvious here that this man accepted Christ. Not as he was presented to him. But as he realized, he truly was. And he realized he wasn't deserving of being saved. But if the qualification to get Christ was to be deserving of him, then none of us would have Christ. And Christ's sacrifice would be empty if we could be that good. But none of us are that good. None of us deserve the cross. None of us deserve Christ. But that is exactly why he came and why he died for you. There is some truth to this. If the first thief doesn't come to his senses and doesn't get saved, then we have one thief on one side of Christ that goes to hell. And we have another man who is saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And what 
makes a difference. We've talked a little bit about that. But there is actually a third thief in our passage. But he's, he's not as obvious. This third thief wants to change your mind about Jesus. This third thief wants to take the seeds of belief and truth in your life and pluck them out. He wants to tear them out of you and teach you lies and teach you deceit and teach you and, and get your minds and eye off of Christ and onto anything but him. This is the third thief on display. And this third thief doesn't want you to trust in Jesus Christ. The difference is where you put your trust. That's the third point. We have an interesting thing that happens in cartoons and movies. And I see this a lot, where the, where the person has to make a, a decision, an important decision, normally a moral decision, and they get the, the devil on the one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder, and they, they start fighting, and then the actual person gets to decide whose advice he's going to listen to. Now, he might flick the one or the other off his shoulder. I think it's interesting. <clears throat> the devil almost always wins in those situations. Now, we know this is fanciful stuff. But I do find the idea somewhat <clears throat> intriguing. Not that we have a devil and an angel constantly telling us what to do. But I find it interesting that those characters, the devil and the angel, always look like us. We do have dueling natures within us. We have the flesh which wills for fleshly gains, and then we have the spirit that desires spiritual things. And these two are dynamically, utterly opposed. One might seem to carry the power in our lives in this life. It seems at times like the flesh is so strong, but I promise you, it's only diversion to the greater power at work in us. And there's a thief that wants to keep your mind off of spiritual matters and place them on fleshly, physical, earthly matters. Listen to John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, this is Christ, that you may have life and have it to the full. I'll name that thief, Satan. Satan is made of deceit, and he wants to confuse and destroy you. If Satan cannot distract you or destroy you, he will disturb you, he will depress you, he will derail you, he will disrupt your life. He wants you to believe the lies that you are worthless and cannot do great things for God. He wants you to believe the lies that God is against you and not for you. He wants you to believe the lies that God is not when he is. And these are all baseless and ridiculous lies. The only way to believe them is not see God for who he is and not see yourself as Christ sees you. What benefit? Let me ask you this. What benefit is it for Christ to gain a thief in heaven? Seriously. This thief wasn't going to jump off the cross and do mighty deeds in Jesus' name, he's not even going to get baptized. I might throw a frog in a few people's theology. What benefit is it for Christ to gain this sinner? Did that thief bring others to believe? I guess he did through the message through the message preached today and, and throughout the century. But on a practical level, it wouldn't mean much to Christ to save this thief. One old little sinner in the midst of all the mass of believers. But Christ doesn't ignore even one sinner who lifts him high. This thief honored him, so Christ uplifted him. And you must lift up Jesus to be saved. It's not just enough to believe in God. Listen to James 2.19. You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons 
believe that. And they shudder. Now, the idea that God is one in, in that James verse is, is, is interesting on its own because that was the idea, that was the theological concept that separated the Jews from most everyone else. It separated the Jews from, from all the heathens that surrounded them. This, this notion that, that God is one. And a very worthwhile thing to believe, of course. And God is one. But now we have a deeper understanding of that. And we know only Jesus brings us to God. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. Let me ask you, what is Satan's number one tool? He tries to make you think you've done enough. He wants you to believe your goodness is good enough. He wants you to believe your conviction is strong enough. He wants you to believe your spirituality is pious enough. He wants you to believe your ritual, your religious practice is enough. He wants you to believe you're enough. He wants you to believe you're good enough. But it isn't, and you aren't, and none of us are really. The people standing and mocking Christ on the cross are as dead and as dying as the ones beside him without the one on the cross. Jesus is the one who brings salvation. Acts 4.12 says there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. John 14, 6 says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. A thief with Jesus is better off than the world's saint without him. And you, if you do not have Christ, are condemned where you stand because you don't, because Jesus is what makes the difference. You know, there might be a lot of reasons right now that people are fearful in the world. I don't know what makes you fearful. I don't know what you're fearing. You might have a lot of worries right now. Financially, health-wise, family, friends. But maybe what you fear is not as important as who you fear. The second thief said this to the first thief. Don't you fear God? Maybe that's the secret. One looked out and believed for this life and said, get us, get me, get him off the cross. Just take us. You're, you're the Messiah, aren't you? Take us down. And the other wasn't thinking of this life but the next. We need to learn to think beyond what is to come and fear instead what is right. You might be afraid of coronavirus, but I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm not talking about economic collapse. These are bad things. But this life and all its ways are fading away. These things are fading. What is to come is what will last. Christ himself said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Christ makes all the difference in the world between the two. Let us pray. Dear Lord, my God, I lift up anyone who might be listening here today, Lord. That you would help us to be sure. That you would not, not let us live in ignorance. That you would not let us live in lies. But God, you see through us. And you offered us salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. It's all there is and it's all there's going to be. So, Lord, if there's anyone listening right now, I pray that you would put a powerful conviction in their life to turn, Lord, from earthly things 
to you to find the salvation that's offered only in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and not through any other means. Lord, lead them this moment to give you their life. And Lord, if anyone is listening right now, and they would just say, Pastor James, I've been playing this game. I'm not authentic. Maybe I believe part way, but I don't believe all the way. Or maybe I'm, I've give, given God some of my life, and I'm not giving him all my life. Or maybe there's things in your life you know you shouldn't be doing, but you're doing anyway. Well, now it's ch your chance to prove you understand the cost Christ paid. He didn't pay that great price so we can play around. So Lord, for them I pray that you would empower us this moment, that you would enlighten us this moment, that you would lead us this moment to live to a higher calling. And Lord, you would bless us as we do. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's listened. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in every way. And thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. We love you. We thank you. It's in his holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for spending an evening with me. I hope you're planning to join me again on Sunday. I, I look forward to, to meeting with you again. And I, I pray you have a blessed Easter in Jesus' name. Thank you.